Anyone not ready? Everyone ready? <laughs> okay. Okay, good. So I think we might as well get started because uh, sometimes you think that time is long. Yeah, we have nine days. I don't know how long you can stay for, but uh, however long you can stay, we think time is long, but actually time is very short. It's always so fast. So this is why it says here, it says BJF retreat, April 20th. It says part one. Sounds good. Yeah, sounds like you're going to go on for a long time. But no, don't get the wrong idea. Actually, it's very short. Yeah. And you will be very surprised before you know it. It will be Sunday or it will be Tuesday. Are you all staying on for both parts or only some of you only for one part? Uh, both parts. Everyone for both parts? Uh, okay. Okay, good. That's, that's wonderful. So, uh, ah, reinforcements. Okay. <laughs> Coffee. Ah, okay. Now, now we're talking. <laughs> Thank you so much, Linda. That's wonderful. Okay. Okay. Excellent. Sadu, sadu, sadu. Mm. <laughs> it's a booster, absolutely. You know, that's a, that's a really we can't. This is the kind of as close we get to drugs on the uh, in Buddhism is the is the coffee. <laughs> that's correct. Yeah. So we keep in mind that this is essentially what life kind of often is about. You know, we think life is going to be go on for a long time. We think this this is just part one of life. No, part one is gone like that, and then part two, and then part three, and then part four, and then part next life. Uh, <laughs> That's often how it is. Uh, the same thing with the uh, the retreats here at BGF. Uh, so uh, I'm just going to give you a little bit of background for what we want to do. Uh, and uh, uh, this retreat here is the, uh, what have I called it again? Developing perceptions, seeing the world like the Buddha. And uh, the idea here is that uh, one, I think, of the most under- talked about aspects of the Buddhist path, uh, one of the paths that is very important for meditation to work, for everything to work in, uh, in the Dhamma, is the idea of right view, uh, seeing things in the right way. Uh, if we don't see things in the right way, uh, if we are completely blind and, uh, I was going to say stupid, but let's say silly, uh, yeah, just a kind of bit more neutral term, if we are very blind, then nothing really happens in our life. Uh, and we are stuck, we're stuck in the same old rut, stuck, stuck in the same old habits, uh, stuck in the same old uh, uh, life after life. Yeah? This is kind of the, uh, the problem of this uh, Buddhist path. So right view is such a fundamentally important part of what we're doing. Uh, I'm going to talk about right view tomorrow night. Tomorrow night there's a public talk. I'm going to talk about this in detail. Uh, but just to give you an idea, you know that right view is the first factor of the Noble Eightfold Path. Uh, and of course, the Noble Eightfold Path, as I have often said, probably here and elsewhere, it is a causal sequence. Yeah, it is not kind of eight random factors put together, but the first one causes the second one, which then causes the third one, and taking it all the way to the end of the path. And because it is a causal sequence, the first one is fundamentally important for how the whole sequence works. So without the first one, there is no Noble Eightfold Path. And not only is it the fact of the being the first one, but the first one has many different degrees to it, right? There is right view, and then there is right view, and then there is right view, right? It comes in a large number of degrees, and it comes initially with this kind of, yeah, a little bit interested in Buddhism, okay, and maybe there is rebirth or whatever, and then, yeah, there really is a rebirth, now I'm getting it. And after a while, it really feels very powerfully as if there is such a thing as rebirth. And when that, this becomes a felt experience, that is when it becomes very powerful in the practice, because then it drives the practice forward, because you can feel it in your bones. That rebirth is, if it is real, well, it has certain consequences. These consequences are very concerning. Yeah, this is kind of the Buddhist idea. And so right view has all of these aspects to it. And one of the uh, first things you will see then when, when you have right view is that leads to right intention. Right intention leads to all the right morality, the right samavacha, samakamanta, samajiva, right speech, right action, right livelihood. This is all about morality. So morality comes from right view. And that is very interesting. And I will talk more about this tomorrow because very often people think, no, morality comes from mindfulness. Because you have to be mindful to be able to be moral. When you're mindful, you can make good choices, you can avoid the ill will, you can avoid the desires, and you can make right choices in life, you can guide your life in the right direction. But actually, no, I think far more powerful than 
mindfulness, uh, in fact, mindfulness itself also derives ultimately from right view. Most important thing is right view. Huh? Yeah, and uh, I won't say much more about that now. I'll talk about that tomorrow uh, uh, evening. Yeah. But uh, this is a very important point. Uh, and uh, uh, mindfulness itself is very weak if it hasn't got the support of right view. And mindfulness often goes out of the window. Huh? Yeah. I mean, I'm sure all of you who are smartphone owners, you know how easily mindfulness can disappear, yeah? I mean, you're kind of you're walking along, you're kind of texting while you're walking in the street, yeah? and you kind of, whatever, you, sometimes you don't know what you're doing, yeah? you kind of walk into a lamppost or whatever. Yeah? That can be very can be problematic. Yeah? So and right here is very fundamental. Just for basic morality, it is fundamental. Yeah? Can you understand me? Yeah, everyone? Yeah, okay, because I know sometimes I talk maybe too fast and I have a funny accent. I know I have a very funny accent, yeah. My funny accent comes from Norway, that's why I speak such ex Not only Norway, but I'm also now becoming more Australian. Right? I live in Australia. Imagine the mixture of Australian and Norwegian. Wow, oh, that is really hard to understand. <laughs> and that's kind of where, where this comes from. Uh, so please remind me if it's hard to understand that. Uh, and I probably won't make any changes, but anyway, you can remind me. <laughs> <laughs> and so right view is uh, such an important foundation. It comes again into the meditation practice. Uh, if you want to meditate, uh, and I say this all the time, there are two supports for uh, meditation practice. One is Sila, the other one is right view. Ujjukaditi and Sila, these are the foundations for meditation. Meditation doesn't work without right view. Uh, why is that? Uh, why is that? It's interesting because sometimes you, 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 can, you kind of know it's true, right? It makes sense. That, but why exactly is it true? Because once you start to understand why these things are, how they work, that's when you start to understand what it is that you have to do. Why is it that meditation only works with right view? And uh, the answer is very simple. The, the process of meditation is a process of letting go. Right? As you let go, the mind becomes more peaceful. Right? This is kind of the nature of meditation practice. Uh, the more you let go of things, the more the mind collects and the more peaceful it becomes. Uh, how do we let go? We let go by understanding things in the right way. Uh, we understand that certain things are not worthy of holding on to. Uh, certain things are dukkha. Why hold on to dukkha? Yeah? This is right view. So right view is what enables you to let go and that enables the meditation practice to happen. Uh, and this is a kind of a nice way of estimating how much right view you have there. How deep is your meditation there? That's concerning, isn't it? <laughs> that tells you how much right view you have. So if your meditation is really deep, yeah? How many here is a really deep meditator? <laughs> no, I'm being naughty. Please don't reply. These are just kind of naughty questions. They're not meant to be to reply to. Um, but yeah, so you... It actually, not, not, not that many people are really, really deep meditators in this world. Huh? <laughs> so, uh, yeah, and so that shows us that our right view also is not that powerful yet. So that's kind of fascinating. So you may know the theory, but it hasn't really penetrated deep inside. Huh? Once it penetrates deep inside, huh? once you start to actually know these things in a personal way, these ideas of right view, uh, that is when it becomes powerful and it empowers your meditation practice. So. And then, of course, it goes further beyond meditation, right view that takes you all the way to the idea of wisdom and insight into all of this. So right view is everywhere. Right view is so fundamental. Uh, and so when I say seeing the world uh, like the Buddha, yeah, okay, let's, let's leave it, put it up there. Uh, when I say this, I... Bobby, are you here? Yes. Ah, there, okay. So I, I'm going to use these slides, Bobby. I hope, I hope you will forgive me. I hope Wai Yin will forgive me as well. I know you have put a lot of effort in, but I just want to have small segments at the time. So, yeah. So thank you so much. Uh, uh, so uh, the idea of right view, well, one of the ways of developing right view, there's a number of ways. One of them is to read the suttas uh, and to contemplate the suttas and understand what the Buddha is saying. Yeah. Uh, and understand how it relates to your life. Yeah, this is kind of one way of developing the uh, the right view. Yeah. But uh, one of the ways, and this is uh, how the Buddha often talks about this in the suttas, uh, is that you develop perceptions. Uh, yeah, when we develop our perception, it means that we look at the world in a certain way, and we look at the world in the same way as the Buddha looked at the world. That's the idea. 
And one of the very interesting things that you find in the Anguttara Nikaya, the numerical discourses of the Buddha, you find a large number of suttas that talk about developing perception there. It talks about anicca sanya, yeah, the perception of impermanence. You develop it, you make much of it, so you cultivate it. So. And uh, there is a sutta which I, I recently, where did I do this? I was in Sri Lanka. I just came back from Sri Lanka recently. I had a really nice trip to Sri Lanka. It was really enjoyable. How many of you have been to Sri Lanka? Yeah, a few of you. Okay, great. It's a beautiful, it's a beautiful country. It's a little bit like Malaysia because it's tropical. Yeah, it's very green and and you have the highlands, like you have the highlands here in Malaysia, you know, the central part of the island, a very Buddhist country, uh, and very, this really delightful trip to, uh, to Sri Lanka. Uh, but anyway, when I was there, we did another of these uh, retreats, yeah, and lots of, in Sri Lanka, the nice thing, lots of monks and nuns came on the retreat, uh, so the kind of, lots of monks and nuns, yeah, there was, uh, it was really, really beautiful. Here, only one nun on this retreat, <laughs> and me, and one monk. <laughs> So, uh, and then we have a case with Amananda on the wall over there, as a kind of an honorary guest. Uh, <laughs> and uh, so, um, uh, one of the suttas we did, there was a sutta called the Anicca Sandhya. I'm not going to do, do it here on this retreat as well. It is basically the sutta on the perception of impermanence. So, and uh, it says in that sutta that that is kind of the pinnacle of all perceptions. Yeah, this is kind of the most important, if you like, of perceptions. And all the other ones kind of derive from that. I'll talk about it more later on. So very, very important one. And you find it in a large number of places in the sutta. So. And then you have the um, uh, Dukkha, Dukkha Anicca Sanya. Uh, or Dukkha, uh, how does it go again? Dukkha Anicca, Anicca Dukkha Sanya. Yeah, this perception of suffering in what is impermanent. Uh, so connecting the dots between impermanence and suffering. Yeah. yeah, And then you have the dukkhe anatta sanya. So the seeing the non-self in what is suffering. Yeah. So all these kind of perceptions and kind of, you know, they build on top of each other. Yeah. And uh, a very important part of these perceptions are the perceptions of things like, you know, not giving rise to ill will, to have more metta and compassion. This is a very, very important part of perception. Yeah. And the way we look at uh, other people, the way we think about the world, uh, will decide whether we have ill will or whether we have metta. Yeah? It's, a, it's a, actually a matter of perception. This is also very interesting. Yeah? Um, and uh, there are also, so, so there's a kind of a very broad spectrum of perceptions. You have the Samaloka and the Virata Sanya, the non delight in the whole world. You have the Ahara Patikula Sanya, the, uh, the seeing the disgust in food. <laughs> I don't necessarily recommend that one. I, I re it depends on how it, if you're really, really attached to your food uh, and you think about the food you know, throughout the entire meditation, then maybe you can do the Ahara Patikula Sanya, but otherwise I wouldn't recommend that one. Uh, so uh, anyway, my point is, is that there's a large number of different perceptions uh, and uh, this is how you gradually align your mind. Uh, yeah? You align it with the way the Buddha saw the world. Uh, and we want to see the world roughly in the same way as the Buddha. Yeah? The closer we get to the way of the Buddha, the more further on on the path we will be, and then that will develop everything else. So this is the uh, idea behind this particular retreat. So uh, is that okay? Yeah, yeah, okay, yeah. Because I'm not going to change it anyway, so it might as well be okay. So <laughs> this is what's going to happen. Uh, so... Uh, that's good. Yeah. So um, let us kind of just uh, dive into it, I suppose. We're going to get start. We just start with the first sutta that I have, uh, have here. Yeah. So this is the, uh, <clears throat> the first sutta, I call the Nibbana Sutta. So I've just said that the right view is at the beginning of the path, and then we start with the end of the path. Oh, okay, well, let's we'll see. <laughs> see what happens. So uh, Nibbana Sutta Anguttara 4 is uh, number 179, uh, and numerical discourse is uh, the uh, sutta, the discourse on extinguishment. Uh, Nibbana being extinguishment uh, of a flame, yeah? 
And uh, this sutta is about the importance of perception on the Buddhist path. Uh, so let's just have a quick, quick look at this one before we get into more details. Uh, So then the Venerable Ananda went up to Venerable Sariputta and exchanged greetings with him. When the greetings and polite conversation were over, Ananda sat down to one side and said to Sariputta. So here we have two of the Buddha's greatest disciples. Yeah, Venerable Sariputta is the right hand monk of the right hand, yeah, right hand monk of the Buddha. He's not here today. He only the Buddha today. But anyway, so sometimes we have Venerable Sariputta on the shrine. Uh, and of course, Venerable Ananda was the Buddha's personal attendant for about 20 years. Or what is it? 20, 25 years, something like that. Uh, and uh, then they have conversations. Yes, this is always kind of interesting. Yeah. And uh, you will notice that when they have conversations, this is also true when they converse with the Buddha, they always start with polite conversations. Yeah, greetings. How are you? Are you okay? Have you had enough to eat? Yes, lots of breakfast. Thank you very much. <laughs> and uh, so, um, how was the coffee? That's right. Have you had enough coffee today? Yeah. And uh, not yet, but I'm working on it. Uh, so, uh, <laughs> and then you sit down to one side and then they have the uh, conversation afterwards. And I think this is kind of, this is nice. Yeah. One of the, I think, really important things in Buddhism is that we kind of, we, feel at ease. Yeah, it's actually really, really important. Uh, and I, I'm always a bit concerned when I see people around the Buddhist world uh, taking the path in kind of the, the wrong way. They're not really relaxed, not really enjoying it. Uh, it's supposed to be enjoyable. Uh, yeah, I always like to say it's supposed to enhance the quality of our life, the idea of the Buddhist path. Uh, and sometimes we make it into something that detracts instead and what a terrible thing that is. Uh, so we need to be at ease. And this is what this is about. You, you know, when someone comes, you don't kind of say straight away, okay, what is the noble eightful path? What? <laughs> you, <laughs> you kind of you get your shock. You start off by being at ease with people. And the Buddha is like that, for goodness sake. The Buddha always puts you at ease before he starts having a conversation with you. And you can imagine it's scary enough to meet the Buddha, right? Would any of you like to meet the Buddha? And well, maybe, maybe not. It's kind of hard to know sometimes, yeah, because the Buddha has this kind of grand reputation and if you met the buddha you might feel a bit uh, you know anxious or whatever when it would be natural uh, so uh, it's first of all relax uh, and this was what we see here uh, and then once you are relaxed then there's the real conversation begins uh, and it begins like this uh, what is the cause reverend sariputta what is the reason why some sentient beings are fully extinguished in the present life This is kind of an interesting question, isn't it? Uh, if we can answer this question here, then we kind of are very clear about the path to awakening and what is required for us to do. Uh, yeah, what is the cause? What is the reason why beings aren't fully extinguished? Why don't they reach full enlightenment? Uh, why is it that some beings uh, uh, don't become arahants in this life? Uh, yeah, most beings don't become arahants. Well, now we will find out why that is the case. Uh, and you may think that the reason is obvious. Yeah, well, the reason is maybe they haven't practiced the Noble Eightful Path. Yeah, that's kind of a good reason to think of. Okay, that makes sense. They haven't practiced enough meditation in their life. They haven't come in on enough retreats at the Buddhist Fellowship, maybe. <laughs> Buddhist Fellowship. Uh, they haven't done the things that they should be doing. That's why they aren't. Yeah, so, you know, why, why does he ask this question? He, he should know. Yeah, he's Venerable Anand. That should be you know what's going on there. What is going on here? But a very important question nonetheless. And one of the kind of interesting things about a great monk like Venerable Sariputta is that when he is asked this kind of question, you can usually guarantee that he will give you a slightly different angle on things. Yeah? And this is what is kind of fascinating. You look at the suttas that were spoken by Venerable Sariputta in the Majjhima Nikaya, for example. They're all this kind of slightly different ways of talking about the Dhamma. Yeah? So you have, for example, when Masariputta teaches the uh, Mahahatipadopama Sutta, the longer sutta of the elephant's footprint, yeah, much like Nikaya 28. And that is kind of unique in the sutta. It's about the four elements and how to contemplate the four elements. Uh, um, 
he teaches, wow, now I, oh, I, what, what does he teach? He teaches quite a lot, actually. Now, of course, uh, he teaches the, uh, the, um, uh, the Sutta on the, the Sutta, the um, Sutta Vibhanga Sutta, Majjhimanika 141, which is about the analysis of the Four Noble Truths. Uh, yeah, it's a typical Sutta for Venerable Sariputta. Uh, he teaches a number of Sutta which analyzes the Dhamma in great detail. Uh, and so he's kind of an interesting, uh, very interesting monk. Uh, and fascinating when you look at a uh, uh, elsewhere in the suttas, uh, and the Buddha, I think this is in the Chattama Sutta, Majjhimanika 67, I think, yeah, uh, where the Buddha says that if I don't teach the Dhamma, Venerable Sariputta and Venerable Mahamogalana, you should teach the Dhamma instead. Uh, he kind of puts them on almost the same footing as himself. Uh. And that Sutta is actually quite nice, the uh, Chattama Sutta. The Chattama Sutta is about the monks being very noisy here. Uh. Yeah, the, the Buddha talks about the, uh, uh, it's like fishermen uh, at the haul of fish. You know that one? You know what fishermen are like? Yeah, yeah the kind of fishermen, they're hauling in the, you know, they're hauling in the, uh, the nets or whatever. And from the ocean, the fish are there and they're shouting at each other. Yes, the monks, we, if they're like fishermen hauling in the nets from the ocean, actually means they're very, very noisy. And the Buddha says, I will have nothing to do with them. I'm going to go walk off and I kind of, that's going to be it. Yeah. And then the other monks and lay people that come to the Buddha, they use some similes to bring the Buddha back again. And one of the similes, the simile of a calf. And the simile of a calf is like if a calf doesn't see, get to see its mother, the cow, the calf will eventually die because a little calf needs to see its mum. Yeah, it needs the milk, it needs the, the care, all of these kind of things. In the same way, these young monks, they will all die if they don't get to see the Buddha. That's kind of the idea. Not die literally, but die in the teaching, yeah, this robe or whatever. And then the Buddha says to Venerable Sariputta and Venerable Mahamogalana, he says that, well, if I don't teach the Dhamma, in other words, if I leave, that as I'm threatening to do now and go somewhere else, then, uh, you know, what should you do? And when Sariputta, well, if you leave, Venerable Sir, then we should just chillax and take it easy. Uh, yeah. <laughs> and when the Mahamogalana says, well, if you leave, then, well, we should do the teaching instead. Uh, yeah. And uh, the Buddha then says, that's exactly right, Venerable Mahamogalana. That's, or Mahamogalana, that's exactly what you should do. And then he tells off Venerable Sariputta for, for kind of giving the wrong answer. Uh, that's kind of interesting, isn't it? To hear this kind of arahants, how they kind of work together. It's kind of really fascinating. Yeah. And it says, Buddha, does, the Buddha says, don't say that, don't say that, sorry, don't, don't say that. That is, you know, that is wrong or whatever. I can't remember exactly the words he used. I haven't read that sutta for donkey's years. But anyway, it's, it's, it's there. That's kind of fascinating. So this is kind of how these, uh, how sometimes you see um, great people, yeah, how they act with each other, how they kind of work with each other. And it's very fascinating because it gives an insight into who the Buddha was and who these great people were at that particular time. And they were kind of, uh, they were a bit quirky like people are today. They had the, their personal character traits. Uh, they, uh, you know, did things a bit differently. And uh, Ben Basariputta was uh, famous for his uh, uh, intellectual abilities and his ability to teach the Dhamma in a, uh, in a very powerful way. Uh, um, but what is uh, fascinating is that just because you are very powerful and you have very profound understanding, uh, doesn't mean you become very arrogant. Uh, yeah. And this is kind of, I mean, sometimes you see people who are very good at something, they become very arrogant because they think they are important or whatever. That means being intelligent, but not being wise. Uh, that's how you know the difference. Yeah? Someone who is intelligent but not wise, they become arrogant about their understanding. Uh, but someone who is also wise, uh, they become very humble about what they know. They don't actually brag about it. Just kind of, okay, you have that knowledge, so what? Uh, yeah, it's not a big deal. Uh, and that is the case with Bhasari Buddha. He was a very humble monk, yeah, despite being the greatest monastic, probably, in the history of humanity after the Buddha. Yeah, still, he was very humble. Huh? And there's a great story where... Um, uh, there's this young novice monk. Yeah, I don't know how old he may have been, maybe 12 years old or something. And when the Putta comes walking, uh, and his robe is not on quite straight or something, uh, and this novice monk, I don't know how he dared to do this, but he obviously dared. He said to Venerable Putta, this great master, oh, your robe, your robe is not on properly, Venerable. <laughs> I can imagine this little whippersnapper telling this kind of great monk. Yeah. And when the Bosai Putta looks, and of course he checks, yes, actually you're right, yeah, the robe is on purpose, so he fixes up his robe, 
And then he says, thank you, teacher, for this little novice mic. Yeah, yeah? it's kind of very, yeah. kind of awesome. Yeah, it's kind of beautiful yeah? because uh, you don't take yourself very seriously. Yeah? So this is very powerful sense of someone who is very special, really deep insight into the teaching. Yeah? Humble at the same time, and also a master meditator. When Basariputta was one of the greatest meditators, uh, he would go into the most deepest kind of meditation, just like that, at the kind of a snap of a finger. Uh, and so had all of these extraordinary qualities at the same time. Uh, so what uh, is he going to say to this question? Uh, now I kind of set up the scenes, and I guess really exciting. So I hope you haven't read ahead. Have you read ahead? <laughs> <laughs> of course, we have read ahead. That's kind of the nature of the game. Yeah. Oh, it happens, so, yeah. so you kind of. So uh, anyway, that's okay. You can read ahead. I, 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 I want to set up kind of the uh, the kind of the, uh, the scene anyway because it kind of still still makes it more powerful. So what is he going to say? So you may have read ahead. And it's like, oh yeah, oh boring. Yeah, okay. Let's see, if, let's see what it says. But actually, it is not boring at all. Right? Yeah, it may seem very ordinary when you see it. But actually, it is very profound. And that is the point. That's why I'm kind of setting this up in this way, to make sure that when you read it, don't take it for granted. Don't think it is simple. Don't think it is just another kind of ordinary teaching of the Buddha. These things are always profound. They deserve attention. They deserve time to really understand what they are about. So this is kind of the, uh, the idea. So now let's see what he has to say now. Reverend Ananda, it is because some sentient beings don't really understand which perceptions make things worse, which keeps things steady, which lead to distinction, and which lead to penetration. Yeah, so uh, this is the reason why you don't become enlightened, because you don't understand which perceptions are useful on the path and which perceptions are not. It is as simple as that. Yeah, so some perceptions, if you look at things in a certain way, it will make your mind worse. You have more defilements, you have more problems, you're further away from the Dhamma. Other perceptions, they will kind of steady your practice, so you kind of stay at the level you are. Some perceptions, they lead to improvement, they have distinction. This is Visesa in Bali. It leads to a distinction, in other words, very kind of high states of mind, like Samadhi or whatever. And the last ones, they lead to penetration. Penetration here means insight. There's another word for insight. You penetrate the nature of things. Yeah? So it is an idea of insight. So the idea here is that we need to, first of all, understand perceptions, which ones we should pursue, which ones we should not pursue. This is number one. And then once we understand which perceptions should be pursued and which should not, then we have to put in the practice uh, to actually pursue those things. Uh, and this is kind of the always the two-stage formula in Buddhism. First of all, understand the reality and then pursue the practice in accordance with that reality. Uh, so again, yeah, you can see here very closely related to the idea of right view. You understand perceptions uh, and then you actually pursue those perceptions in the right way. Uh. So what can we say about these things? Uh, what are the perceptions? That lead to making things worse. Yeah, and uh, it is kind of obvious and uh, to take some very simple ideas, uh, perceptions like, for example, if you look at someone and you get angry with them, yeah, that perception you have of that person at that time makes things worse. So what is that perception? Okay, bad person. They are hurting me, yeah? They are evil. They are whatever. Whatever it is that you perceive in a person that somehow makes you angry, that is a bad perception, yeah? Because it makes things worse. So very, very simple. So we have to learn to look at people in the right way. And this is actually not that hard to do. And I would really kind of suggest to all of you that you put a lot of 
time and effort into these kind of perceptions. Uh, I will talk about the sutta, which I talk about on every single retreat I do later on, uh, to talk about how to develop this in a skillful way, how we can see people and think about people in a way that does not give rise to anger, but also is not stupid. Yeah, we don't want to become stupid about other people. We want to be intelligent and at the same time not give rise to anger. That's kind of the holy grail of perceptions when it comes to non-anger here. So the other, another perception that makes things worse is too much greed, right? If you look at something and you feel really greedy, then of course, that is a problem. So you, you look at um, how you perceive things. And of course, usually the reason why you get greedy about things uh, is because you look at something, you think it's beautiful, yeah, it's desirable. I want that because it's beautiful or whatever. That's kind of where it comes from. And so what you have to do there is that you have to then remember the problems with the things that you are greedy about uh, and look for a higher kind of happiness in life. That's really kind of where you kind of challenge those kind of perceptions. Uh, another kind of perception that makes things worse is the perception of permanence. Uh, thinking that things are stable when in fact they are not. Uh, yeah, and remind yourself of the instability of things in the world. Uh, another one that is seeing happiness when things actually are suffering. Uh, yeah, very important perception. Uh, so you actually try to really sit, understand where suffering is to be found and where happiness is to be found, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So this is kind of how you deal with these things. And it's quite simple, nothing really fancy, yeah, quite kind of down to earth, but still very, very important. So what are the perceptions that keep things steady? And this will be things like when your uh, meditation is going well, and you want to kind of stabilize the meditation for a while, yeah? So you stay with the meditation for a while. You don't kind of progress to the next stage too early, but you hang out where you are for a while. Uh, or you are starting to develop meditations of metta. You don't try to straight away to develop even more metta, but you stay with that metta for a while because you know you need to have it solidly established before you move on to the next one. Yeah? So you steady it for a while before you then move on to the next one. Yeah? Perception would lead to distinction. Well, this I have already kind of explained that already. Yeah, It's the idea of uh, uh, doing the opposite of the things that make things worse. Uh, and finally, the uh, uh, perception that leads to uh, insight or understanding fully is just, a, again, a further development of the same thing, especially the development of the perception of impermanence, uh, and especially after deep meditation is when these things happen. Uh, so a general idea of perceptions in this way is really the first, the starting point of all of this. Uh, and as we get these things established like this, then uh, things begin to come together and right view can become much more strong as a consequence. Uh, so half an hour has gone already. So uh, <laughs> we can have it. What is it? What is it? A sh meditation and then Q and A. Is that how it works? Probably. I can't remember now. Yeah. Yeah. Ten okay. Minutes, so we uh, we have a ten minute break, and during these breaks, you are welcome to just sit quietly yeah. and meditate, or you can uh, do whatever you like. Have a cup of tea if you want. Really do anything you want, uh, and then we'll have a quick Q and A at, uh, after this. Uh, Okay, so maybe we should carry on then before the retreat is over. Just <laughs> so, uh, okay, so if anyone want to comment on what we have done so far? Uh, any questions uh, on what we have? Uh, please uh, fire away, as they say. Uh, What are you hoping to get out of this retreat? Uh, enlightenment or just stream entry? Yeah. <laughs> what is your kind of, do you have any goals for the retreat? Have you no goals or are you here because you are a beginner, beginner to Buddhism or are you, are you more kind of been coming for, I know some of you are coming for a long time because I know some of you very well. <laughs> um, are you uncertain? I'm uncertain what you expect uh, see what happens. Uh, <laughs> 
Please. Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah. Uh, okay, but the Ajahn uh, Brahmali, uh, I have a question here in terms of uh, the, the, the statement about which lead to penetration. Yeah. That is the insight, right? Yeah. So can you explain more? What do you mean by insight here? Yeah, it, I know it's a very deep kind of uh, words yeah. Yeah, for insight. <clears throat> so in, in this case, it means very deep insight. So insight can mean many different things. Uh, insight can mean like uh, small insights. Yeah, like you, uh, uh, you, you read a suit uh, and suddenly, wow, now I understand what it means. That's kind of a small insight, if you like. So insight can mean a, a number of things. Uh, but in this case, and it, the idea of penetrating means to kind of see deeply into the nature of things, to kind of penetrate the nature of uh, reality. So here it means something profound. Uh, here it probably means something like stream entry, yeah, becoming a stream entry or something like that. Uh, and uh, so what, how, you, how you do that? Well, you do that basically by seeing impermanence of things, uh, seeing things are unreliable. Uh, uh, but in this case, if, you, if it's going to be very profound, it has to be combined with the idea of a very powerful mind, a very still mind, the kind of mind you have after the samadhi experience, for example. That's the kind of mind that can actually penetrate very deeply into things. So you come out of a state of samadhi, and then you, you, you review what happened in that state of samadhi, called, called reviewing knowledge, uh, pachavekana and jnana. And then you, uh, when you review it, then you kind of see what has disappeared, what, what is no longer there, and you contemplate that state of samadhi itself as impermanent, as a reason because of uh, your practice or whatever, uh, then uh, I think you have the loudest door that I've ever heard. <laughs> a very a powerful door. So then you review uh, all of those things, and then you, uh, this is kind of how it happens. Basically, it's about understanding impermanence, that's what it comes down to. Anicca is the most important thing. Uh, uh, and of course, that also relates to understanding dukkha, suffering, and non-self at the same time, because these things always are uh, three characteristics, always go together. Uh, they're part parcel, uh, the same kind of idea. Uh, Ajahn, good morning. Good morning. Can I know what Ajahn's uh, understanding of perceptions? The what meaning of perception. Oh, the meaning of perception. Okay. Okay, good. A very good question, actually. Uh, so uh, I should have uh, explained that. Anyway, so the, the Pali word behind perception is Sanya. Uh, one of the five khandhas. That's a very important uh, part of how we analyze a human being, a human being is usually analyzed into five aspects, uh, and these are called the five khandhas. Uh, and you can, kind, you can call them the five aspects of a human being, or the five personal aspects, or something like that. Uh, and uh, oh, this is the third one, and the, the first one is usually called form, uh, and that, or, or appearance, and that is when you look yourself in the mirror and you think, that's me, that's kind of the first one. Uh, second one, feelings, is about uh, Basically, about whether you like things or don't like things in the world. You, if you like something, it's good feeling. If you don't like it, it's bad feeling. Uh, then you have the perception. And perception is how you recognize things in the world, uh, yeah? how you know something. Yeah? And, uh, so, uh, and it can be anything. Like, for example, when you, when you relate to the world through the five senses, uh, the only way you can understand what you are relating to is through perception. Uh, it's kind of amazing. Imagine I'm talking now and you can understand what I'm saying. Why is that? It's kind of weird because there's a sound coming out of my mouth, but it's very different from hearing a car on the street, right? You're actually able to draw out meaning from these words. So these noises that are coming out of someone's mouth. It's kind of extraordinary. This is how we communicate. And that is all perception that enables that communication to happen there. You're able to perceive the individual words. You're able to perceive the overall meaning. And then we can actually communicate on that basis. It's almost like a miracle when you, 
when you think about how how this noise can become so meaningful. Uh, uh, or like you see things like you see things now, yeah, you, the way you make sense of this room and everyone here is through perception, how you can see people, how you make sense of anything. Uh, again, uh, uh, but, but in terms of uh, what it means in this particular case, it means a very kind of fairly, it's a bit more narrowed down, yeah, because here it is perceptions that actually matter as far as the spiritual practice is concerned. Uh, and so here we're talking about perceptions that make things worse. There will be things like, how do you perceive other people? Now you can, you can perceive someone, the same person in different ways, depending on how you, how you relate to that person. So you can perceive someone as an enemy or as a friend, and it can be exactly the same person. And the reason why you perceive them as an enemy or a friend or a neutral person would just depend on how you apply your mind, it depend on your Nisomani Sikara. Yeah, uh, you can see someone maybe you don't like, uh, but even if you don't, even if you find them difficult, uh, you don't have to regard them as an enemy. You can still have compassion for, towards them. Uh, you can still regard them as a suffering being. Uh, yeah. So small change in how you think about the person can lead to a different kind of perception about them. Uh, yeah. So uh, and so and this is kind of the the amazing thing about the mind. If you use the mind in the right way. Uh, you can flip your perceptions like that, uh, yeah? You can be like, oh, I, you know, this person, I don't like them to actually, this person, I have compassion for them. It can be like one thing after another, very, very fast like that. Uh, so this is perception, yeah? How we kind of, how we regard people, how we think about them, how we, how we see them. Uh, and often it is very fast. It happens almost straight away. Yeah? You, you see someone straight away, you have a feeling about them. That perception arises very, very fast. Uh, uh, seeing things as permanent and impermanent, we tend to see things as uh, far more permanent than they actually are. Uh, yeah, and this is also a kind of perception. Uh, it's like a, a relationship we have to the object, the, the perception, uh, and how we think about it. Uh, so it's a very, it's one of these very broad categories of uh, that, that we uh, that we deal with. Uh. Does that make sense? Are you happy with that? Yeah? Okay. Gives you some idea. It's actually very, very, very broad, uh, basically, this, uh, this category here. Yeah. Please, Ajahn. Um, on the um, topic of discernment, yeah. how is the development of discernment? So discernment. Okay, so these are English words, so I, we have to apply them to the Pali language somehow, so we have to decide what Pali word we're dealing with, uh, otherwise we have a problem. Uh, so discernment is sometimes a translation of vipassana. Vipassana is sometimes translated this way. Uh, and I think that's the translation used by uh, Venerable Tanisaro, I think, uh, uses the word discernment. Uh, I think, is, that, is it vipassana translated as discernment? Uh, I think so. Panya uh, vipassana, I think it's, I think it's vipassana. Um, so I would say, if we're dealing with the word vipassana, I would say that it means uh, clear seeing. Clear seeing is similar to discernment. Yeah? Discerning means that you are... Um, discernment means you're uh, uh, basically it's about clear seeing, a very similar kind of idea. You discern it properly, you discern it appropriately according to the Dhamma. Yeah, this is actually very similar to the idea of seeing things clearly. And so I would say that uh, the idea of vipassana is about that, seeing things, seeing things clearly, seeing them for what they actually are. Uh, and uh, the uh, opposite of vipassana is when you are confused about things, yeah, or you are deluded about things. Uh, so very often vipassana is translated as insight, uh, but I think insight takes it too far, because insight uh, is very almost, in, in English, almost uh, indistinguishable from, from wisdom, uh, because when you have an insight, it's like a light bulb going on, bah, now I see, uh, that's actually what wisdom is, uh, whereas vipassana is what leads to wisdom in the suttas. Uh, you have vipassana that leads to wisdom. It's specifically mentioned in one of the suttas in the Anguttara Nikaya. So it's primary, it's preliminary. See things clearly, see them clearly and clearly again and again, then wisdom arises from that. Uh, so this is how I understand the uh, term vipassana, and uh, you could say that's, uh, that's what discernment is in this particular case. Uh, yeah. Okay, shall we, maybe we sh maybe hold your question, we can take it afterwards, is that all right? Uh, because, uh, yeah, time is always very short on these things, uh, so. Uh... <clears throat>